Good evening, all. This is W2NDG, Neil, on WA2MJM, the OMARC repeater. And welcome to the Sunday night, 8 p.m. Science and Technology Net. Let me drop for any emergency traffic. Okay. So, we welcome listeners and participants to the Sunday Night OMARC Science and Technology Net. This is a weekly net and a directed net run by myself, W2NDG, Neil, and Jim, KD2BHM, K2BHM. And we come and we talk about science and technology and get our listeners' opinions and listen to what's going on in their technology and science worlds. So... Uh, we've been covering basic elemental topics so far on uh, the last couple of nights. Um, tonight, we're going to pick another one. We're going to talk about time. Last week, it was space. So time is a pretty broad topic, but our goal here tonight is to talk about it in general and then try to relate it back around to uh, what we do, ham radio operators, and how it affects our hobby. So, um, we're going to take check-ins, and uh, and I'm going to hand it over to Jim, my co-host, first. And then when Jim is done, we'll take check-ins, and uh, I'm going to speak a little bit about time in general. Um, Jim's going to talk a lot about of, uh, historical and engineering specifics, and uh, he's going to do, uh, as far as the setting the, the, the mode and... Um, the uh, direction for the discussion, Jim's going to do probably more of the heavy lifting tonight. Um, and then we're going to go around a couple of times tonight and just get your opinions and your comments on things. But uh, this is definitely uh, more related to the things that we do. And uh, we're looking forward to uh, this discussion. So first, let me welcome Jim, KD2BHM. Jim, come on now. Jim, Jim here. Um, I was thinking of uh, taking a stroll back in time, um, going way back and investigating the different uh, techniques, methodologies, and equipment uh, over the years and their progressions in the uh, measurement of time and the advances, the more intricacies, the more accuracy, and uh, things we can do with it. So that's uh, kind of where I was planning heading. And uh, I think we can have some fun with that. Um, back to you, Neil. All right, excellent. And uh, we're going to take some check-ins now, and uh, we'll probably uh, ask for a few more later, but this just helps us catch up a little bit. All right, so to check into the net, you give me your call sign, your name, and your location. And uh, please come now. All right. Well, we've got a good start on the net tonight. Um, so we will do uh, a rotation at some point. Uh, but if you have um, if you have a, a, an urgent comment, <laughs> don't hesitate to throw your call sign out. But we're going to do a little uh, back and forth between Jim and I here. Uh, 
Uh, let me drop again and see if there's any more check-ins real quick. And of course, the phone is ringing. <laughs> this is Neil W2NDG on the Sunday night Omar Science and Technology Net. So, time. Time is time is it's a thought. It's a concept. It's fluid. It's a tangible thing. Um, where I'm getting with that is when we look at concepts or ideas, um, they mean something to us at a certain level that we don't necessarily have to quantify. Your brain knows what time is without having to define it because time in what we're talking about is a linear thing, at least as far as we perceive it. Things occur one after another, after another, after another and uh we we realize that concept very early on in our lives even before we can assign thoughts and words to it let me drop and i guess what i'm getting at with that is um a concept if we ever do discuss language um there's a couple of books i've read that talk about um comparing the language in our brains to uh, the way we look at computer processors. And, you know, a computer, the, the most basic form of um, programming language that a computer understands is something called machine code. Um, it doesn't mean anything to anybody unless they're an expert in that type of programming. Let me drop. So the question was that came up is, um, is there machine code to our brains? Is there a basic language that every brain operates in before it translates whatever it's perceiving to English, German, Japanese, whatever language you have learned, Morse code. Um, some people learn Morse code to the point where they can actually think in Morse if they uh, shift gears like that. So think about, during the course of the day when you perceive things and whether or not your brain is actually assigning words to them or not. And I'm going to give an example of how this works with respect to time. If you like me still like um, analog clocks and analog watches, I'm not wearing one now, but I do own uh, a number of analog watches. Um, if you look at your watch to observe the time, let's say it's uh, exactly right now, 8.08, and you look at your watch, and your brain sees that it's after 8 o'clock, not quite quarter after. Um, and it doesn't really quantify numbers to that for a lot of people, especially those of us who are trained on analog time. Let me drop. W2NDG on the OMARC Sunday night science and technology net. So... Try this sometime if you know somebody who has an analog watch on and you see them look at their watch and see what time it is, ask them immediately after they looked at it, what time is it? And they'll probably look at their watch again. Um, that's normal. And frequently, like with the current time right now, if you ask me what time it was and I looked at my watch, I probably would say 8.10. I might even say it's almost quarter after eight. Um, I would not say 8.09 because my brain's not looking at it like that. Now, when someone asks me the time, I may interpret it into a, a digital number. Um, but when you're not providing the time to somebody else, you really don't think that way. If you wear a digital watch, if you grew up in an age when that's you know pretty much everything there was and you didn't learn to tell time on a regular clock face, then your brain might work differently than mine. I don't know. But it's just an interesting way to look at it. And uh, it's also the same reason why a lot of us people who grew up in an analog world um, can't stand digital speedometers because it's always changing. It's, you know, it's hard to 
grasp that concept in your mind of doing about 60 miles an hour when the speedometer is constantly going 59, 60, 60, 59, 59, 60, 61, 60, 59. So this is uh, the ways we, we perceive time. Time occurs without us defining it. Your brain knows what it is without assigning numbers to it. But very, very early on, primitive man had to deal with it. So I'm going to drop there and hand it over to Jim. This is W2NDG on the Homework Science and Technology Net. Thanks, Neil. K2PHM here. I'm going to take a few minutes and uh, invoke Mr. Wizard to uh, turn on a Wayback Machine and take us all the way back to Og the Caveman. Um, this could be fun. Um, Og came out of his cave and noticed that uh, every rock and tree and blade of grass and bush and whatever had this dark thing on the ground that emanated from its base. And uh, it moved during the day. And its movement was uh, repetitive and predictable. And uh, he decided that he could take some little rocks and put them at different points where the shadows were during the day. And it would be there uh, during the day, repeatable. Um, we uh, call that the, uh, <laughs> the solar clock, the sundial. Um, and so now that became handy because he could go to uh, Grog and say, hey, Grog, meet me at the uh, fishing hole at uh, three rocks in the afternoon, and uh, we'll do some fishing. And life was good. Um, what the heck? Um, they uh, got up when they felt like getting up in the morning and went to bed when they went to bed at night and ate when they were hungry. It's kind of like retirement. They haven't invented uh, jobs and bosses and commute yet, so life was good. So... Anyhow, drop a second. So everything was doing good until one day when Og got there and uh, Grog didn't show up at the fish stall. So he's doing an analysis and uh, he kind of figures, well, okay, it's not cloudy out, so uh, it's not a problem with the sun. Um, maybe uh, birds stole his shiny rocks or whatever. Uh, maybe an infestation of termites. Um, maybe a flat tire. No, it can't be a flat tire. We didn't invent the wheel yet. But anyhow, um, we'll work on that. So uh, they uh, dealt with uh, the sundial for quite a number of years. And somewhere along the way, they decided that a day would be composed of 24 hours. And somehow it stuck. Why was it 24 hours? I don't know, I guess 23 and 25 were busy doing other things, so whatever. But 24 hours was it, and it stuck. So anyhow, um, later on, somebody noticed that a rock on the end of a stick would swing back and forth, but it had a mind of its own. You couldn't make it swing too fast or too slow. It swung at a certain particular frequency. And... Uh, if you change the size of the rock or the size of the stick, it changed the frequency. So uh, we can use that for something. What are we going to use that for? Um, hey, Grog's grandson invented the wheel. We could take a wheel and uh, put some pegs in it and let this thing go back and forth and index the pegs and put that into some gears and so forth with uh, some little pointers. And uh, we can make it... Uh, indicate what hour of the day it is a lot more accurate than a shadow on a stone and so uh, we start the process of uh, uh, improving the measurement of time you drop again so okay we've got escapements we've got gears we've got pointers we've got uh, weights and stuff like that we got ourselves a clock but it's big and bulky um, it uh, is so big they have to put it in the upper part of a building in the town hall, and there's only one per village. So it becomes the town clock. But really, who cares? Because everybody's using one instrument. So if it's a little fast or a little slow, it's serving the purpose of getting everybody together all at once. And uh, they even invented the idea of uh, 
making it ring a bell every so often, every hour, so that uh, people would know what time it was without having to poke their head out the window or go around the block or whatever to see the clock. And life is good. It continues on. So, anyhow, um, they uh, continue their process and make things smaller and more accurate and better. And we get it down to the point of where a clock now is small enough to fit inside of a piece of furniture in your house. And now everybody can have one. So uh, now everybody's got one. we got to worry about them all being at the same time. Because uh, you don't have one master clock now that everybody looks at. They've all got their own. So drop a second. So now we start to notice that summertime, the clocks are running a little slow. And wintertime, they're running a little fast. Well, as it turns out, that metal rod that we use for the pendulum uh, gets longer or shorter depending on temperature. So somebody came up with the bright idea of, well, the weight, if we use mercury for the weight, that expands and contracts with uh, temperature as well at a much higher rate. And if we do it just right, we can do something called automatic temperature compensation. And we don't have to worry about it uh, losing time or gaining time or whatever. It will be automatically on the right time and uh, a much better thing. And then we continue miniaturizing and continuing on to the point of where um, we got it down to the size of where you could put a watch in your pocket or on your wrist or on a necklace around your neck. And uh, things progress very nicely. And we've got it to the point now where we can take an hour and break it down into minutes and seconds. So life is progressing very nicely. But we still have another problem. Things are getting faster in life. Um, we invented musical instruments and uh, higher frequency vibrations and stuff like that. Um, so somebody discovered that you take a piece of metal and form it into a U-shape and put a handle on it. And when you hit it with a little hammer, it vibrates back and forth at a very precise frequency. And we can use that to check and calibrate the vibrations on our musical instruments, the violin, the harp, uh, whatever. And so now we can make sure that everybody is on the same frequency and it sounds good, very pleasing, um, very good advancement. Um, but now we're not going to stop there. Um, we started getting into electronics now and we noticed that um, electrons oscillate back and forth in a wire, just like the strings do on a uh, violin. But they're much faster. How do we account for that? Well, somebody figured out that uh, if you put uh, an electric field on a quartz crystal, it will vibrate uh, just like that tuning fork does, but at a much higher frequency. And you can control that as well. And you can use that to either generate a frequency or check a frequency or calibrate a frequency. And uh, we took uh, another major leap in advance there. So anyhow, we went from counting off uh, hours to counting off minutes to counting off seconds to counting off hundreds of hertz to counting off millions of hertz. And uh, life goes on. But we didn't stop there. Um, we recognize that uh, there is a certain resonant frequency to cesium-133, and uh, we can use that much like a tuning fork or a quartz crystal. And uh, National Institute of Science and Technology invented the uh, atomic clock. Now, the atomic clock, that is accurate to one hertz in 100 million years. So accuracy there is phenomenal. Um, that opened up all kinds of doors, all kinds of possibilities. Um, and things go on from there.
But like Neil said, um, we can measure time, but there are other interesting things too, like measuring distance. Um, you can uh, tell if a person is walking or running or a horse is trotting or galloping or your car is going 30 miles an hour or 60 miles an hour. Um, that's important. Um, why is it important? Well, um, if you're going down a road at 30 miles an hour and there's a curve ahead of you, um, you can navigate the curve nicely. If you're doing 60, you have got to keep on going straight because of something called centripetal forces and centrifugal forces and friction between the tires and the road and so forth, uh, the mathematics and whatever. So time and distance now becomes an important safety factor. And uh, we have to uh, uh, basically accommodate that um, to keep our lives safe. Um, but uh, let's go on from there. It's a little more interesting. I got to bring up my childhood hero, Bugs Bunny. Bugs Bunny would stand there facing the east, take a baseball and hurl it just as hard as he could. And immediately thereafter, he turned his back on it. And about 10 seconds later, that baseball would come hurling right back at him from the west. And it had stickers on it from uh, England, France, Germany, China, whatever. It made it around the world. Well, Bugs was so stupid. The moon does that too. The moon is up there and it uh, progresses around the earth. Um, the horizontal velocity of it and the forces due to gravity uh, pull it down and it's in a balance and uh, it uh, makes an orbit around the earth. Bugs Bunny's orbit with the baseball was 10 seconds and uh, the moon is 28 days. And uh, there are various different things in between, all governed very nicely by mathematics. And uh, very useful. Let's, uh, let's see what we can do with that. So now, if we take a rocket and send something up, oh, hundreds of miles up into the air, and uh, get it uh, traveling around the Earth, um, we can put some interesting and fun things on there. Um, sensors, uh, cameras, uh, radio transmitters. Um, what happens if we put an atomic clock on this satellite and put it up in, uh, up in the air? Well, okay. Uh, we got a clock, but so what? Um, well, what if we put two clocks up there and uh, we have a receiver? that has a clock in it. And we can look at the time in the receiver and the time signal from satellite A and the time signal from satellite B. Well, we know that uh, uh, light and radio waves travel at 186,000 miles per second. So we can look at the delay between our clock and the signals from A and B and tell what the distances are to the two satellites. That could be useful. Okay, well, that, that was fun, but not really that useful because I can tell where I am, but that, uh, that kind of puts me somewhere on the Earth along this line. Uh, but three satellites. Now I can, uh, I can go and narrow it down into a point on the Earth. But uh, the problem is, is I need a very accurate clock in my GPS receiver. And I don't have the time and money for that. That's... that's expensive. Um, what about if we took a fourth satellite and uh, use that as another reference and did all the math and let that correct the clock in my GPS receiver? That would work. Well, it does and it did. So we have now 31 satellites navigator roading around the earth just for the United States. Uh, China and Russia have their own satellites too. And uh, we can take a receiver and we can look at the signal timestamps coming off of um, 
three, four, well, four or five or six uh, satellites uh, correct our time base and analyze the distance between us and the satellites and position ourselves anywhere on the Earth within four feet. Um, that's pretty impressive. Now, how do we do that? Uh, how do we how do we know? Because what goes up must come down. And uh, you put them satellites up there, and they spend the rest of their time coming back down to Earth. Well, that's simple in a way. Um, we take uh, base stations here that we know exactly where they are, and we use GPS to figure out where GPS thinks they are. And from there, we go and send correction signals back up to the satellites so that they think that our control stations are where they actually are. And now, your station knows exactly where you are, whether you're going down the road to Grandma's house, or flying in an airplane, or taking a hike up Mount Everest. So, uh, basically, uh, time is very important. Um, and uh, basically, uh, I had a question for Paul, but I don't know if he's uh, here listening. Um, Paul, if you're here, um, you might handle this question a little easier. Um, when you look at the clock, time seems to be going slower in molasses. And when you're on vacation, time seems to be zipping right along. So <laughs> I think that's your bailiwick. Anyhow, I think I took up enough time. Uh, Neil, back to you, K2VHM. All right, <clears throat> Jim, thank you. Um, very comprehensive, bringing us right from uh, Og <laughs> all the way up to GPS. And what would Og say if you handed him uh, your phone with GPS enabled and told him to walk around? He'd probably try to eat it first. Anyway, this is Neil, W2NDG on the OMARC Sunday Night Science and Technology Net. Um, we're going to pause for some check-ins again real quick, and uh, then we'll continue on the subject. Um, I do want to add that, you know, as we quantify time, and obviously Jim is starting to say how important it is, there are cultures that perceive time differently than we do. Uh, and that's a, another thing to my basic definition. Um, do they count time differently? No. Is is do they? You know, is there such a thing as metric time? Something that uh, Jim and I poked around at? No. You know, um, uh, we've always, at least as cultures around the world, we we measure time the same way. But um, there, are different cultures value um, time differently, and uh, there are places where it's not unusual for people to not be on time to appointments that you've made. And it's okay. They don't mind. And they don't seem to think that it's a problem in either direction. If you're late or they're late, it's not a big deal. Um, we're kind of right in the middle in uh, America. And, you know, we, um, we, we like people to be prompt, but some people aren't always prompt. But there are cultures that are the opposite of the first one I mentioned, where if you are any more than seconds late, it is considered to be rude and uh, um, just not acceptable. So um, as they always say, learn the language, learn the customs, especially if you're doing business. W2NDG on the OMARC Science and Technology Net. I'm going to drop for more check-ins. Call sign, first name, and location, please. Thank you. All right, after we go around a little bit, um, we will, of course, check again. So any of you listeners who uh, haven't had a chance to get to the radio or anybody who hasn't checked in yet, we will have some more time. So, um, and Jim, thanks for all of that. Um, so let's go around a little bit and uh, talk about what time means to you and 
um, whether you're, uh, you consider yourself to be an analog person, a digital person, and uh, how much you rely on some of the technology Jim talks about to make sure your time is accurate. Uh, we'll start with, uh, with Paul in Rosendale. Go ahead. This is a very broad topic. <laughs> you know, you just start talking about all this uh, time. And the National Institute of Standards and Technology has a uh, radio station transmitting that a lot of amateurs use for, for uh, references. Uh, not just not just uh, the time, because, you know, the, the time is, you know, whatever it is. Uh, you know, two point, uh, what is it, 2.5, 5, 10, 15, and 20 megahertz range time of day and all kinds of other things, but uh, a lot of little things that you can get off of that. It's, it's very, very precise, uh, the frequency that it transmits on. So you can use it as a reference for amateur radio. You know, where's your, your, your uh, rig transmitting on? Well, I, I referenced it to WWV, the, uh, the, the, top, the time and frequency station. Uh, it's, it's very, very useful. You know, we used to use a channel marker, or not channel markers, crystal, crystal markers. Kind of like a... Uh, what's it? Uh, one megahertz, one megahertz crystal marker. I think it was something like that, or and they got divided down to and uh, just like that was a lot of fun. You 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 go in there and you, <laughs> you you're verifying you verify your rig is on frequency by referencing it to a a, a time and frequency uh, marker, uh, but. Uh, that's where I look at it. Then again, I, I work for a railroad, so let me break here. I work for a railroad. You know, you had to be at a certain time at a certain place at a certain time to clear up for a a, a passenger train. Hell, you know, you just start. You know, you now you start to look at standardized time. Um, going back to you know standard time. Well, what's standard time? You know, if you go back to you know each town had its own clock. Well. Over the years, they decided that standard time took care of the problems of trains being late all the time or early. You know, you say the train for the 12 o'clock train left three minutes ago, but you know, <laughs> so uh, it's standardized timetables and things like that when it came to cross country travel. Ah, I don't know, I'll pass it on. That's for you, IQ. Oh, thanks, Paul. And, uh, WWV is definitely something that we'll talk about and uh, some other related stations. Um, it's one of the first things that, uh, as a kid, you know, I tuned into on shortwave and questioned. Um, we all know the sound um, used to be a little different. Um, it, it changed, I think, just before I started listening to shortwave in the early 70s. Um, and uh, it's changed a little over the years. It's uh, possible it might go away. A lot of us wouldn't like to see that, but, you know, technology has killed uh, a lot of things on the HF bands. Um, you can remember how many more shortwave broadcast stations there used to be than there are now. And uh, although there are still some things that rely on WWV, uh, there aren't as many. So we'll definitely talk a little more about WWV. Um, so, Jed, KD2KJU, um, any comments or uh uh, things you'd like to share with us about uh, anything you've heard so far. E2 KJU, uh, thanks Neil and, and uh, Jim. Um, not much more to uh, not much to share exactly, but I really really enjoyed um, uh, Jim's uh, uh, explanation there and and and. Uh, Kind of went to try to record it and realized that this is not going to happen. So I hope this is uh, uh, being recorded so I can uh, listen to it um, at some point. Uh, some point. Um, but for the time, I'm, I'm just going to uh, uh, enjoy the conversation um, because I'm definitely enjoying it so far. I will send it back to Net Control. This is KD2 KJU. Well, thanks, Jed. And yeah, it is being recorded for now. The nets are on uh, my YouTube channel. Um, I think if you just search for Omark Science and Technology Net in YouTube, it'll come up. Uh, we will eventually continue them on uh, 
the Omark YouTube channel once we get all that sorted out. And I might even be able to transfer the existing ones over there. Uh, we'll find out. So, but thanks. This is W2NDG on the Omark Sunday Night Science and Technology Net. Next up is uh, Tom from Fishkill. And the bird is quiet. <laughs> Tom, go ahead. Your thoughts on time so far. W2NDG in the group N2FDC. The birds are sleeping now. And when it gets dark, they like to go to bed. Anyway, uh, speaking, of, speaking of time, <clears throat> like it was uh, referenced that... Uh, a lot of uh, time got standardized because of the uh, the railroad, the trains. Everybody had to be pretty close to the, the same time, uh, and when the, so the, the trains could run consistently. You know, everybody used to have a noon is when the sun is overhead, but they move a, a bunch of miles, and then your noon is really different than other noons. And so it's sort of uh, fluid, but uh, you know, jumping forward to where we are now, we need very exact time you know, for GPS and uh, you know, DMR, digital, um, you got to know uh, where your time slot is and your, uh, your your radio has to know the time slot so it can sync properly so we can pass traffic. So a big change in the accuracy of, of time, so yeah, an interesting uh, concept. And uh, personal time, uh, I, my alarm clock, of course, is my cell phone, like uh, many, many other people. But I do have a, uh, a clock in the bedroom. But I always keep it a random 12, 14 minutes fast. So, uh, you know, when I wake up in the middle of the night in the morning, I look at it. And... Uh, <laughs> In the back of my mind, I think it's a different time, and it gives me, uh, you know, 12 or 11 minutes. It's never an exact, so I, I throw my brain off uh, how you consider time. So just an interesting note there. So this is N2FCC. Back to that. Well, it's a good point. And um, as I said, everybody perceives differently. Um, you know, that, that once again, that... Uh, uh, going back to my original definition when I was talking about how we perceive language, how we perceive everything, uh, you know, um, colors, you know, what my brain thinks is red may not be the same thing your brain thinks is red. And along those lines, uh, some people are really good at judging time um, without even thinking about it. I can count off time in my head if I really need to. I'm pretty good at counting off seconds and uh, figuring out, you know, how much time has passed. Um, but depending on the situation you're in, everybody is different with that. Um, we all do things that, that, you know, scare you. Like when you, when you wake up, you know, five mornings in a row and you wake up one minute before your alarm clock goes off, uh, stuff like that scares us, but our brains are capable of this. Um, it's just a matter of training. Interesting stuff though. Um, Let's see. Up next would be Jim in Poughkeepsie. Uh, KD2VAH. Go ahead. I've never had a job that I showed up on time. Any job I've ever had, I was an hour early. Always. Don't ask me why. I'm just, I'm just OCD about that. I show up on time. If I was running late and showed up on time, my entire day I was behind. I still now wake up 3.15 every morning. I mean, I, I go back to bed eventually, but I wake up 3.15 every morning. Now, on the other hand of time, you know, I mean, we say we can, it's real, and you can measure it. You remember yesterday, so you must root time. I, I don't know. There's some folks, and I'm not saying which school I belong in because I don't know. Let me drop for a second. There's some folks that tell you that there isn't any past or future. There's just the present, just now. And then, of course, you'll tell, have people tell you, well, we can measure something. Okay, but get into quantum physics, and allegedly, according to that, just your mere fact of measuring it has changed it. 
So, uh, I don't know. <laughs> anyway, back to net. Yeah, still, yeah, all about perception. <laughs> oh, the early to work thing. Um, yeah, different employers look at it differently, too. Um, I uh, had an employer I worked for for quite a number of years where I had um, a rather volatile commute into work. And, you know, there were days that it took longer to get there than others. And he didn't care. Didn't matter. Didn't want to hear it. You know, I chose where I lived and I needed to be on time. So um, I had to start anticipating when there was going to be issues. Once in a while, there are things you can't avoid, but it happens. And then what I learned many years later when I was working in Manhattan is that most Manhattan employers have very fluid start schedule schedules because they know that a lot of their employees are dealing with the public transportation system. Um, and as long as you do your job and you're on time to very important meetings, they really don't mind so much. If you walk in 10 minutes late, it's not a big deal. And that's a different thing, like I was saying, with different cultures looking at the on-time factor in different ways. Um, my particular team that I work for at work, um, we have pretty flexible hours. When you know, Before COVID, when we were all there, as long as we had coverage, as long as there was somebody who could deal with an emergency between the hours of, let's say, 8 and about 5, 5.30ish, uh, as long as there was somebody there on call, whatever it was, um, but we could work pretty flexible hours. So if you wanted to come in an hour early, you could leave an hour early. Um, and there are a couple of guys that always worked later. They came in at 10 and worked much later. It just worked better for them with the commute. Let me drop. The problem occurred uh, with another department that we were uh, right next to when they hired somebody who was not from New York City originally, and they couldn't accept that um that was such a foreign concept to them and uh there was a there were a lot of confrontations um when you know employees would be late and get written up for it but you know they were stuck you know on a subway car for 45 minutes because there was a tunnel fire or you know any number of things that can make you late in new york city and uh the particular uh, manager that had been hired didn't want to hear it um then leave earlier and they said, fine, so if I come in an hour early every day, do I get to leave an hour early? No, you wait until your start time if you get here that early. It was kind of unreasonable. And um, in the end, uh, actually, the manager didn't last. <laughs> Everybody else did. So um, it's, it's a different world down there. And people adjust their time to various situations. So, you know, you hit the road to go somewhere. You make a mental note and you say, wow, I'm going 60 miles and I'm going to be doing probably an average of about 65 miles an hour. I should get there in a little less than an hour. But the minute things start slowing down or the minute things happen, your brain starts to recalculate all of that. And you start to uh, just roughly think, well, it's going to take me 10 minutes longer. It's going to take me 15 minutes longer. Well, if I speed up to 85, I can make up for some of that time. You don't think about this stuff in the specific terms that I'm saying. Your brain kind of does it without you actually saying it out loud, unless you have passengers, of course. But we, we this is how we think about things like that. Paul, KD2IWC, your comments so far. Uh, thank you, Neil. Uh, I'm going to drop for a second. I just wanted to make sure I wasn't talking while the, while the beep was still beeping. Um, kind of ironic you're talking about time today because for the last two weeks I missed the net because I was late. First time was because of daylight savings time, and second time around you changed the time. So I did manage to arrive on time tonight uh, to listen in and join in the conversation. Um, and I just uh, something I'm going to throw in. Uh, I worked for the phone company for my career and. In Kingston, in the office, they had a electronic device in the equipment racks called the clock. And the clock was connected to the major clock for the country, which I think was in Kansas City, if I remember correctly. 
And all of our digital communications are timed off of this one atomic clock in Kansas City. And uh, the clock in Kingston was just an outpost. Um, so that's uh, every all the digital stuff running at the same uh, time uh, allows the communications to continue. Uh, so uh, that's it for me for now. And back to the next. All right. Thanks, Paul. And uh, yeah, um, do you remember? I'm trying to remember what the number was. It was uh, it was a three three one number. I think it was three three one one nine two, and then you could put any number in there, and it would, uh, in a very friendly voice, give you the time. Do you remember that, Paul? Yeah, we used to, when we were testing somebody's phone and we needed to call out, uh, we, used, we used to use that a lot, although I don't remember what the number is anymore. Yeah, my brain, which can't remember the name of somebody I met 10 minutes ago, thinks it's 331-192. They, they used to list it as 1920, but it could be 192 almost anything. It was like the, you know, the ringback number, which was basically... You know, for calling people on your party line, um, you know, when you substituted different digits, uh, it would ring different patterns. I think you guys used that for testing too. But yeah, um, that was one way to get time. Um, if you didn't have a watch on you, didn't have a radio on you, you could do it that way. If you had uh, an AM radio, you could put WCBS AM on, and you know they uh, announced the time usually every uh, certain number of minutes, and then on the hour. Um, they used to have the tones. They don't do that anymore, but uh, they even advertised, you know, uh, on the hour you hear the tones. The third and loudest tone is the exact time, you know, um, similar to WWV, but it was a way to, to set things. Um, but certainly interesting stuff. Um, let me throw over to Jim for comments on the comments. <laughs> KD2BHM, go ahead. Jim here. Yeah, lots of uh, um, different ways that it affects our lives um, as we go along. Um, and uh, the technology is at so many different levels over the years. Um, and different ways of accommodating different things like the temperature compensation of the pendulum. Um, then we got into uh, heated crystal ovens to keep them stable and stuff like that. Um, Lots of technology, and uh, lots to talk about about WWV. I don't know when you want to get into that. Yeah, we can hit that next. Uh, this is W two N D G on the Omark Science and Technology Net on Sunday nights. So um, WWV keeps coming up, and uh, it's been around a long time. I don't know the history. Um, of when it started. I really don't. Um, but there are um, basically it's stations on uh, standard carrier frequencies. Uh, so that's another standard involved in this is that um, the stations are broadcasting a standard time signal, but they're also on a standard frequency, a frequency that is so exact and so accurate that the two stations that are broadcasting on that frequency, because they also have WWVH in Hawaii, if you're in a situation where propagation is good enough that you can hear both stations, you will hear them simultaneously without um, heterodyning, which you get when signals are not exact and dead on to each other. Um, so that's one interesting effect that you'll hear, which is why, you know, when we get doubles on the repeater, it's rare that you'll hear both signals exactly at the same time. There are ways to make that work and ways to make that happen, um, but it's uh, complicated. So but WWV is out there. Uh, let me drop. Uh, broadcasting on, that would sound like the announcer, internationally allocated standard carry fre carrier frequencies of 2.5, 5, 10, 15, 20, and they did bring back 25 megahertz. 
Um, I don't know if it's still back, but it was back for a while. WWVH in Hawaii um, only covers, I think, 5, 10, and 15, possibly 20. But it's either those, those three or four only. And um, the announcements are staggered. So if you're getting both stations, you will hear a female announcer announcing the time, and then you'll hear a male announcer announcing the time. The female announcer is Hawaii. The male announcer is Fort Collins, Colorado. And uh, it's uh, great for several things. Let me drop. There is a way to harness the time code out of it and use it to run things and make things accurate. Uh, because the frequency is so accurate, it's a great way to calibrate and work with equipment. Um, you know that it's 10 megahertz. It's always 10 megahertz. It's not going to float. It's not going to flutter. Um, with the exception of certain uh, atmospheric or seismic events that may affect it. And uh, some of the software that monitors and works with this stuff is actually going to compensate for things like that at times. Um, if you want to do audio calibration. Um, if you look at the signal in a program like, let's say, uh, I'm trying to think of the name, FL Digi, where you have an audio waterfall. Um, there's even modes for calibrating your uh, sound card in uh, FL Digi. And you'll see the tones. And the tones, um, even though they change from minute to minute at times, um, it's documented. If you go to the National Bureau of Standards, you can look at a chart for what tones occur at what point during the hour. Let me drop. There are points during the hour where you won't hear a continuous tone. You'll just hear like a tuck, tuck, tuck. Um, when you hear that out of Colorado, it's because Hawaii is doing um, announcements. Um, they give uh, things like solar weather um, and other information at standard points during the clock, during the hour. And uh, Fort Collins does the same thing. And Hawaii is silent with the tones while Fort Collins is doing it. At the top of the hour, the uh, zero tone is different. And you get a station announcement at the top of the hour. So it's interesting. It's always been there. Um, as long as I can remember, someone else may know the exact uh, history and start date. Uh, one more drop here. Uh, Chris is um, asking a question in the chat here. Uh, do other countries have time stations, and are they linked, or do we hold the clock? Um, other countries do have time stations, and uh, they're usually running off of that country's own atomic clock. Uh, the most common one that a lot of us are familiar with is CHU in Canada. CHU operates on frequencies uh, 3.330 megahertz, 7.850 megahertz, and 14.670 megahertz. Um, it's a different sound. Um, it's a tone. And then there's some data bursts, which can be decoded if you like. Um, a fun way to decode it is by using the uh, SDR, the Kiwi SDR, um, online SDRs. So there is a mode in the plugins that allows you to decode CHU. Uh, I lied, one more plugin, or one more drop. <laughs> uh, so C CHU does the data bursts, and then there's a, a French announcement and an English announcement, which uh, alternate minute for minute um, one of them is uh, more complete than the other. So you'll hear CHU Canada, Coordinated Universal Time, and then it'll give the time, and then the French announcement is just the time. And then they alternate, and then you'll hear the French announcement of the station, and then you'll just hear the English time only. So that goes minute for minute and alternates. Um, the decoded data has to do with the fact that and Jim might elaborate on this further, there isn't 24 hours in a day, and there aren't 365 days in a year. So um, we can talk about that a little further. WWV does it uh, also. There's a subcode um, underneath everything that kind of gives that information. 
But there's a, out of Fort Collins, Colorado, there's also a long wave, very, very, very low frequency station that broadcasts time code only, nothing that you would be able to understand with your ear. But there's all sorts of devices that stay accurate with that low frequency signal um, that you can buy. At least there used to be. So we're seeing more GPS stuff now. But there's still things tuning in to WWV. I forget if it's VB or VL because they used to run both. And one of them is no more. W2NDG on the OMARC Science and Technology Net. Uh, Jim, anything else on WWV or time stations in general? Thanks, Bill. KTBHM here. Yeah, WWV has been around since, oh, God, I don't know. I, I think it's like the 40s or something like that. And uh, all of their uh, audio tones, um, their uh, carrier frequencies, um, the digital timestamps, they're all referenced to the uh, CGM clock, so they're all extremely accurate. And uh, going back, uh, oh, back into the 80s when I started playing around with uh, digital frequency counters. Um, you had a crystal in the digital frequency counter, this was your time base. But you had a little capacitor so that you could uh, calibrate it. Well, what do you calibrate it to? Well, back then we had um, color television sets, analog. And there was a color burst oscillator in there. And it was 3.579545 megahertz. And it had to be not only precisely on frequency, but in phase with the transmitter that was transmitting the TV signals, or your color should be all way off. So you could uh, uh, throw a loop around the color burst oscillator coil inside the TV and read that because that was locked to the transmitter, which was locked to a standard. And uh, I think you were something like one part in 10 to the minus 9 if it was uh, local and 10 to the minus 12, which was uh, network broadcast and gave you a very, uh, very stable signal. Let me drop a second. Very good way to calibrate your frequency counter and make sure that uh, uh, you're on the band. And then something strange happened. Analog went bye-bye. And digital, they don't need a color burst oscillator. It's all digital. There's no relationship. <laughs> the sound doesn't even match the uh, video anymore. So uh, that's out the window. Um, so we're depending on WWV. But uh, budget cuts and stuff like that, um, they're going out the window. And uh, the only thing that is hanging in is, like you say, that 60 kilohertz signal that an awful lot of clocks are depending on for their updates. And uh, they're going to keep probably a skeleton of the frequencies that were there and probably keep the 60 kilohertz, but all of that's up in the air right now. But uh, there is hope. Uh, QRP Labs uh, has a uh, prog rock. It's a programmable digital frequency synthesizer that uh, works off a um, 27 megahertz crystal and you program into the computer chip uh, what frequency you want out and you get anything out of it from, uh, oh, I think it's 350 kilohertz on up to almost 300 megs. And accuracy is good because it's a crystal oscillator. But, here comes the big but. You can buy a GPS receiver and the um, synthesizer now is slaved to a reference pulse coming out of the GPS receiver which is linked to the GPS satellites which is based on an atomic clock. So basically WWV is no longer necessary. Um, you can get a accurate signal off uh, GPS receivers. So uh, that's my two cents. KGBHF. All right. And I've looked into that kit because uh, I have a couple of uh, Hans's kits, QRP Labs. Um, that's where the, the QCX Mini came from that we've been talking about so much. Um, and it's a uh, 
definitely interesting. He has a, just a standalone clock kit, and then you can add the GPS time standard to a number of his his kits, um, which is something uh, we're going to get into. Um, why is time so important in ham radio? Um, we'll head in that direction. But WWV, um, cool stuff. And like Jim said, hopefully it won't go away. There are, uh, in addition to CHU, because Chris was asking about other countries, there are other um, time frequency and standard stations around the world. A lot of them have gone away, but there are still some other ones. Um, I'm sure there's a web page that probably lists all of them. The way I used to look for them was um, there's a book. It's one of the last um, yearly books published with uh, any kind of information on broadcast stations around the world. Uh, it's called the World Radio TV Handbook. It used to be published by uh, Billboard Corporation uh, back when uh, Andy Warhol, I think, owned Billboard. Um, but it's still published. Uh, a lot of the other um, guides and publications have gone away. WRTH, or World Radio TV Handbook, is still around. You can order it from Amazon or Barnes & Noble or almost any of the radio outlets um, still carry it. Um, great handbook. It basically lists by country what that country's radio and TV standards are, what their um, national radio is, you know, the government-funded radio, and what their commercial radio is if they have commercial radio. Um, it's neat if you do a lot of traveling. Definitely worth having. But there was always a page in there that said standard time frequency signal stations, and it listed all of the time stations around the world. Um, and they're different. Every single one does things differently. So good stuff. W2NDG on the OMARC Sunday Night Science and Technology Net. Uh, we're going to pause for some more check-ins now and see if anybody else wants to check in. Please come now with your call sign, your first name, and your town. If anybody needs to check out, let me know, and I'll mark you out, and uh, we'll go to you in a, another rotation. Please come now. KD2 UUI, John from Oliver. All right. Thanks, guys. Thanks for checking in. Uh, John's been throwing some stuff up into the chat here. Um, interesting. He was, and I think we'll uh, maybe we'll hit up a little of this after uh, after uh, next subject or two. But um, John was basically implying that uh, in his uh, own research that um, people perceive time differently when they're in different states of consciousness. It's interesting and something uh, we didn't talk about before. So um, so for uh, those of you who are checking in who haven't been following along on YouTube or uh, we're talking about time, time in general, how we perceive time. Uh, Jim gave a very cool speech on the history of, uh, of time, the computation of it, the tracking of it, and how we've gone from, you know, shadows and rocks to sundials to mechanical clocks to crystals to atomic clock clocks to gps and so on uh we were just talking about wwv and where it fits into the world and ham radio in general and uh, we're slowly heading into uh what time does for us in ham radio so um we're going to throw out to uh comments and uh, we'll take the the mobile station first so that's, um, I believe, uh, KD2RWW. So come now with your comments. KD2RWW. Uh, I was listening in since you guys started kind of in and out. And time is uh, an interesting subject. But uh, one of the other interesting subjects that has to deal with time is how in the heck do my animals know when I'm a 15 minutes late feeding them when they have no concept of failing time that I can tell? That is the question. And with that, I'm probably going to secure 
for the night because by the time uh, the next go around comes around, I will be on the shadow side of the mountain and at a repeater range. KB2 RWW. Great, Bob. But um, I can answer a little about the animals. There's, there's probably two thoughts there. One is that animals do perceive time. Um, I think that uh, they perceive time in different ways than we do because we have the aid of mechanical things and technology. I think if you take a, a lot of that away, we would probably be able to have our internal clocks working better than they actually work. Um, so that's part of it with animals. The other thing with animals is they sense things that we do that we don't think we do. Um, you know, it's like the people who are trained to read body language. Um, there's all sorts of cues and things that we do that can be read like a book. Uh, your animals learn little things that we don't think about. Um, I remember my aunt, my aunt had this poodle and she told me one time that, you know, the cleaning lady always came on Tuesdays and Thursdays and, um, he, he would know the day the cleaning lady was coming, um, always, even if she shifted days. Um, and she couldn't figure out what it was that she did that he managed to know. You know, he always would do certain things and go sit by the door right before she came in the door. And he would know that she was coming, even if she changed her day. So she could never quite figure out, but there were probably a sequence of events that she did, you know, hung up a towel in a certain place or um, closed a certain sequence of doors in a certain order. And animals sometimes are a lot more observant than we think they are. Um, I know my cats here have figured out certain nuances and cues that make them realize that things are happening. Um, it's kind of cool if we could look at things from their point of view and maybe we'd understand time a little bit better. Great uh, point, though. John, UUI, uh, your comments. Good evening. We all perceive time differently. Different cultures perceive time differently. In our Western culture, most of us perceive time out in front of us on a timeline. The future on the left, the past on the right could be reversed. I used to use timeline therapy in my hypnosis practice. Some people perceive the future out in front of them. Some cultures, as Jim said, see the past behind them, or they don't. Some cultures, if you arrive within a three to five hour time zone, you're on time. Not in our Western culture, though. We test in sessions by asking our clients simple questions. Once we're aware of how they formulate their individual time, we can hallucinate new powerful changes, eliminating fears, phobias, past events, Doing 37 years of regression work in New York City, 8 to 10 hour sessions one on one with people, all I did over my entire career was manipulate one's hallucinations of time. Back to you. Neat stuff. Yeah. You probably would have been interested in my um, little discussion earlier on of the machine code of the brain. Um, you know, does our brain have a base language? We don't actually think in English. Cool stuff, though. Um, Aaron, uh, you're, were you mobile or at home? I'm sorry, I forgot to ask. <laughs> I know you're in New Paltz. Uh, KC2NDA, Aaron, uh, would you like to make some comments on tonight's subject if you're still there? All right, that's fine. Um, we'll uh, check on you later in case uh, you come back. But... Um, Part of this is relating it to what we do and how is time important to our radio activities? Um, a lot of things in radio are scheduled. 
uh, either a hard schedule or a soft schedule that uh, is a, a result of nature. Um, hard schedules, um, if you're into uh, broadcast radio, shortwave radio, um, you know, obviously there's program schedules. If you listen to stations, you know, um, even music stations, you know, uh, the first DJ is on from 7 a.m. to 10 a.m. and the next guy is on from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. and so on. Um, the news stations um, pretty, run a pretty hard schedule. If you listen to WCBS AM, um, you'll see that, you know, there's always uh, world news at the top of the hour and then local news a few minutes later. Um, they give uh, traffic and weather every 10 minutes at uh, 08, 18, 28, 38, and so on. Uh, sports at 12 minutes past the hour and 42 minutes past the hour. Financial news at 25 minutes and 55 minutes past the hour. Do I listen to this stuff a lot? Yes. Um, but my point is, is that a lot of this is on a schedule. And uh, when you get into shortwave broadcast listening, which leads a lot of people into ham radio, or at least did back when there was actually things to listen to, these stations come on for an hour or two hours and then sign off. And you need to know that schedule in order to know when they're coming on. Um, that's like I mentioned the book, World Radio TV Handbook, but there's other books that were published on the subject um, where you could look up when things were coming on. Um, the internet killed a lot of those publications, but there were, of course, magazines too, monitoring times, communications, uh, popular communications that listed the, the shortwave station schedules. Let me drop. In ham radio, we don't have a lot of hard schedules. We do for contesting, um, let's say. So there was a contest on that we were all talking about a couple of times over the last couple of days. That contest ran from um, Friday night at 8 p.m. Eastern time to tonight at 8 p.m. Eastern time. So there's a hard schedule for ham radio. This net is at 8 p.m. Sunday nights. Um, this repeater has nets twice a day at 8.35 and 6.30. So that's hard time. What is soft time in ham radio? Well, Mother Nature plays with the atmosphere, and the sun has cycles with the seasons. Um, one of those largest time events would be the sunspot cycle. Every 11 years, we reach a either a peak or a valley, uh, depending on how you look at it. Um, but the peaks are roughly 11 years apart and the valleys are roughly 11 years apart. And that cycle is pretty consistent back through time. Um, different bands are active during the day than bands at night. Uh, and during the day, as time goes on, um, you'll find in the morning, 40 meters is great. And as you get towards midday, 20 meters starts opening up and towards later in the day, um, 40 meters will start coming back, and at night, 80 meters is open. Um, it's a lot more intricate than that, but that's an example of soft time and how it has an effect on our hobby. Now let's talk about exact time. Let me drop. When you play with digital modes, there's a lot of timing synchronization that makes this stuff work. One of the first modes that required really precise time is not actually what we call a QSO mode, but a propagation reporting mode, and that's Whisper, W-S-P-R. Um, Whisper runs on a two-minute cycle, and in order for it to work, your clock must be exact because you need to start transmitting at exactly the same time that the system, the Whisper system, expects you to start transmitting, and you stop transmitting. Um, think about 10 or 15 seconds before that two minute period ends to give the software time to decode everything it may have heard. Whisper is cool. Um, it's an automated system usually, stations all over the world transmitting on specific frequencies um, at very low power. And it all gets fed into computers that are receiving on those frequencies and put up to servers on the internet. There's uh, maps where you can look at the propagation results and see um, pathways between point A and point B um, that might be working at different times of the day on different bands. Really handy. Whisper, W-S-P-R. If you search for Whisper Map in Google, you'll see what I'm talking about. Let me drop. Um, 
modern um, QSO modes that aren't really what we call conversational modes, but more just QSO exchange modes, uh, starting with um, um, not FT8, but it's uh, it's Forerunner um, JT65. Uh, JT65 was a, a long, drawn-out process with, I think, a minute to each part of the QSO. So uh, it was kind of like, um, you know, watching the lawn grow, watching the bread rise. Um, but it was neat because uh, it's somewhat automated, and it's something you could run in the background while you were doing something else. But you st it still requires skill to uh, hop on the signals when uh, you want to grab them. And the same thing, because you're dealing with a cycled transmit and receive between two stations, everything has to start on the exact minute and end at the same time. Um, Joe Taylor and company um, realized how popular it was getting them on HF hams. Let me drop. And they shortened that cycle to 15 seconds. Uh, makes it a lot more usable, a lot more fun. Um, I know there's a lot of hams out there that don't like FT8. I found that most people who tend to poo-poo it haven't really used it, haven't really tried it. Um, there is a certain amount of skill involved in grabbing the stations. Um, are there people that run in full automatic mode? Yes. Um, I wouldn't do that. Um, you know, ham radio is ham radio. You're going to get out of it what you want to get out of it. If your idea of a challenge was coming up with a method to do that and you succeeded, then you got something out of it. That's fine. Um, I'm not going to argue with you about that, but I like to run FT8 in more of a manual mode. And uh, there is definitely some skill involved in getting the contacts. Um, but with 15 second intervals, timing becomes even more important. Let me drop. W2 NDG on the OMARC Sunday Night Science and Technology Net. Talking about FT8 and other uh, quick automated modes with timing. So your computer, which is running these things, you can't do uh, FT8 and uh, some of its derivatives without a computer. So how do you get the time exact on your computer? Well, um, Linux and Unix based systems are usually pretty accurate. Um, they're usually querying a time server uh, pretty often and, and keeping that time clock within, uh, an, uh, you know, fractions of a second usually. Um, it, it's, it may drift a little uh, between checks, and there's ways that you can change the, the scheduling um, for how often it checks. But I found in most cases that the only thing you might have to do to a Mac, which is Unix-based or a Linux system, is to uh, point it to a different time server if it's having trouble uh, communicating with the one it's it's poking at. Let me drop. Windows, however, has a lot more trouble keeping time. Uh, it doesn't check quite as often, and uh, frequently the time servers that it's poking at aren't always there. It needs a little help. Um, I recommend a piece of software called Mineberg. M-E-I-N-B-E-R-G, Mineberg. You install that on your computer. It's free. Uh, it's mentioned in the WSJTX, which is the FT8 software. It's mentioned in the WSJTX uh, documentation. And Mineberg will keep your Windows clock accurate. Um, it's, it's very good. If you uh, ever want to listen to FT8, you tune into one of the frequencies and you'll hear all the crazy tones pretty much start at exactly the same time and end at the same time, you'll hear a couple of stragglers in there, uh, sometimes really late. Those are the people who aren't synchronizing their time correctly and they're not going to get anything. It's not going to work because everybody has to be receiving when people are transmitting and everybody has to be transmitting when people are receiving. FT4 made this even more critical because now we're at seven and a half second cycles. There's very little decoding time involved. So everything has to be super accurate. FT4 is more of a contest mode, but really speeds things up when we drop. Timing, accurate timing is important for satellite communications and ham radio. You're tracking satellites. Um, Satellites are moving overhead. 
and they're going to be at very specific points at very specific times. Also, because they're in motion, and sometimes in motion, uh, the velocity is at a rate that it's going to affect the frequency of the radio waves because of the Doppler effect. And that is also part of using time to calculate things. Um, your computer that you're using possibly to calculate the correct Doppler frequency is going to need to have a time standard for that, a very accurate one. So there's a lot going on in our hobby that does require accurate time. Um, and one more point of time in ham radio. Let me drop. You know, when I was a kid, they always referred to it as Greenwich Mean Time, GMT. Um, and then that kind of changed to uh, Coordinated Universal Time or UTC or Zulu. Sometimes you'll hear people say, um, which is basically London time without any adjustment for daylight savings. Um, Eastern Standard Time is five hours behind um, Zulu or Coordinated Universal Time. This time of year, when we're in daylight savings, we're four hours behind that standard time. Um, as a shortwave listener or a ham radio operator, a lot of things are given in UTC. And that is so that we're all on the same page, no matter what time zone you're in. So contest stops and starts, sometimes net times are given in it. Um, if you are an active ham and have all your equipment in one place with your computers, a lot of us will have a clock somewhere on the wall or on our desks that shows both local time and UTC. So uh, this is W2NDG on the OMARC Sunday Night Science and Technology Net. I'm going to throw it over to Jim for comments on what's been said. That's fine. I'm going to look at YouTube comments here real quick. Um, so John was saying, Western culture mostly hallucinates time out in front of them, left to right, future left, past right. It's why we have accurate references. Other cultures see the future in front of them. Um, and he talked about, when we were talking about pets, Pavlov, of course. Uh, conditioned response. Dogs hear footsteps. They salivate. Classic case. Yeah, good point. Um, I know my cats um, immediately know when I'm heading towards the, the cabinet to get their food um, as opposed to heading to it to get something else. There must be something in the way that I walk or the way I carry myself that um, they'll know. I can fool them, definitely, you know, if I'm thinking about it, but uh, they certainly know things. Um, Chris commented, uh, is that the same realm as seeing the same time on a regular basis when looking at the clock, not the morning alarm, but an unspecified reoccurrence. That's a good point. Um, yeah, I, I've had that happen too, um, where you'll have a certain number of days in the, in the row where you, where you look at the clock at the same time, uh, that can be kind of freaky, um, also. And you, know, you have to ask, you know, is this something that's occurring in me internally? Is it a coincidence or is it something else in my environment that's making me do this? And that other thing is actually time synchronized. Um, you can really tear this stuff up and it can really make your brain hurt. So <laughs> John asked, imagine if we didn't have an internal clock and all these millions of processes ran just when it was convenient. Yeah, <laughs> that would definitely mess things up. Um, you know, we have the, the cycle of the sun, um, which changes, you know, with the seasons. And I think that's how uh, uh, animals understand, you know, when the seasons are changing and, you know, when to eat more, when to eat less, not just with temperature, when to leave, when to come back in the case of birds. Um, certainly a lot of stuff on this subject. So, um, 
time with radio. Let me drop. This is W2NDG on the Sunday night. Omar, Science and Technology Net. Um, not a rotation now, more of a, just an open throw your call sign out. Um, can anybody else think of somewhere that we're using time in amateur radio? Go ahead, Paul. Uh, no, not Paul. Go ahead, Tom. Yeah, make up a name, whatever. <laughs> not having to do with ham radio, but uh, circadian rhythms, you know, you have a, a time rhythm. And um, they've done studies wherever where they put people, you know, we have a 24 hour day. They put people in like a dark cave and uh, sort of let their internal clock get unsynchronized and, uh, you know, you come out with a 26 hour or 27 hour day and uh, stuff like that. So it, it, the internal when the internal clock doesn't have it's not crystal controlled. All right, there you go. And we could probably keep listing these for a while. <laughs> um, all right. Uh, let's see. I think it's uh, Jim VAH um, said that he has a, uh, a comment. So, um, Jim, go ahead. All right, this is stupid. You know, I got the HF set last night and hooked it to them, tend to play with it. Well, of course, I end up on an AM band listening to a radio station. <laughs> anyway, it's our bell. And I'm thinking, what is this thing going back in time? <laughs> Well, anyway, he brought up one of his people on that talk show, and it was a it was a crazy show. But anyway, brought up something about the dams that they're building are slowing down the earth. Now, theoretically, because our entire time system, especially like Jim was saying, is pretty much based on the cycle of the sun and the moon and blah blah. What happens if the dang thing does slow down? Well, what do we do? Just reinvent a new system, shorten the day, lengthen the day. I'm in. <laughs> Go ahead, Jim. I knew you'd want this one. Wait a second. It's something I started to allude to earlier. Um, and the Earth actually is slowing down, uh, which what Jim is talking about is every uh, every year, or is it a certain number of years, we have to add uh, leap seconds. <laughs> um, but my take, and I think Jim will uh, agree or maybe expand on it further, is is that um, it's there. It's tiny. Um, there's just you know really tiny amounts that we have to compensate for. But if something ever happened that caused the Earth to slow down enough that we would actually notice as human beings, I think we'd have a lot more to worry about than time. Uh, go ahead, Aaron. I didn't know if I was, uh, I think I missed a rotation, but uh, I don't know if we're still on a rotation or not. No, just um, open now with uh, comments on what we're talking about. Okay. I didn't want to uh, comment out of turn. Uh, yeah. Um, I think we should uh, position a nice, um, maybe let's say a nuclear rocket so that way we can have summer all year round. How's that sound? Comment. Uh, comment. Call sign and then comment. KD2VAH comment. <laughs> Go ahead, Jim. We'll train you yet. No problem. Uh, the problem with the nuclear thing in my mind, anyway, is yin and yang. If we have summer all year round, somebody's going to have winter all year round. That's the problem with the whole world, give and take, I guess. I suck it up. That's why I look at it. <laughs> Wait, uh, I caught a little bit of the conversation here and there. Uh, time is everything. This is pretty cool, uh, especially when you're dealing with FPG. 
CPAs. I don't know if anybody's ever programmed any or set any of them up. Timing is awesome. Well, there was a double in there, but um, yeah, uh, there's so many things in uh, advanced radio, commercial radio, that require time standards. Um, you know, we uh, have been dealing with um, uh, DMR locally in our club, um, moving in that direction. And, you know, there are things there that have to be uh, very accurate in order for that to work. So another good point. So how about if we slow the earth down completely? and just face one side of it towards the sun all the time. And then it'll always be somewhere on that side. <laughs> How are we going to tell time? <laughs> um, I think we might have some issues doing that though. Well, anyway, this is W2NDG on the OMARC Sunday Night Science and Technology Net. Let me drop for a second. Um, what I was alluding to is that anything that would cause the rotation of the Earth to slow down, let's say shorten the day by as much as a minute, um, would be an event that would cause, I think, pretty serious disasters. So um, a pretty delicate balance that we live in that makes everything work exactly the way it does. So any event that would cause... Uh, the, uh, the Earth to slow down either in its own rotation or its rotation around the sun to a noticeable point would have to be something pretty catastrophic. Um, you know, that's, uh, you know, like trying to uh, stop that spinning wheel on a car that's up on a lift with a blade of grass. It's not going to happen. Um, if you want to stop it enough that it makes a difference, you're going to leave a mark. W2NDG on the Science and Technology Net. Uh, any more comments on the subject? Any other thing you can think of that we use time for in ham radio that we haven't discussed? Go ahead, Aaron. Um, timing on digital. Yeah, it's the reason why you can't use an analog amp on DMR. No, I kind of mentioned it, um, but we didn't really cover it. Um, and different digital modes use time in different ways. Right. Well, the other thing I was thinking, um, I wanted to design something, but uh, back in college, I uh, didn't really have, didn't really understand what I was talking about. But, uh, you know, digital is one and zero. And then, of course, they have tri-state, things like that. But why stop there and uh, use frequency instead or use light, which now everything is uh, going fiber optic. So I think they probably already have uh, what I'm thinking about already done. Uh, quite possible. Um, yeah, as, as, as time marches on, it will become more and more connected. <laughs> um, the different systems that have to be synchronized are going to be more accurate to each other. What happens when, you know, um, as we rely more and more on that, what happens when those systems go down, right? Well, that's why you have to have, you have to make it so you can replace them quickly. So, uh, totally agreed. You know, you got servers out there and then you have a special board or a special card. And then what do you do when you don't have one? Exactly. Um, and there's a lot of uh, talk about calibration with things like that. So let me give a really basic example. How many of us grew up with uh, a plug-in LED digital clock on the nightstand that had a little battery holder on the bottom for a 9-volt battery, right? Um, that clock got its time standard from... Where? I'll wait for the, the first person to throw that in. Where's the time standard on a plug-in next to the bed LED digital clock that a lot of us grew up with? How does it know um, how to keep time? What's it set? Quartz crystal. 
negative. Anyone else? It's a 60 cycle hum on your AC. Bingo. Exactly. Which is why um, makes it interesting. If you had a, a clock that was uh, dual voltage, um, when you switched the voltage, it also switched the uh, cycles it was counting. Um, and if you had it set wrong, uh, your time wouldn't work right because like in England, I believe it was 50 cycles. So they're counting the cycles um, and it's a pretty accurate um, time standard, actually. It really is. So that clock would be fairly accurate. So that clock that wakes you up so you can catch the school bus, pretty accurate. But um, those of us that did have the ones with the battery holder and if you had a working battery in it, how accurate was that clock when the power went out? Um, I had some that were and some that weren't. I can remember having one that was way out of whack when the power went out and woke me up, you know, um, half an hour late, I think, um, to get to school. So um, whatever time standard that it was using as a backup was definitely never calibrated, never adjusted. Um, you, know, you can open up a digital watch which has a quartz crystal in it for keeping time. And somewhere in there is a very tiny adjustment that helps make up for the slight errors that might exist in that quartz crystal. Are there errors? Yeah, definitely. Uh, because that you know, $10 uh, Walmart watch might not be as accurate as your $350 uh, Citizen Quartz or Seiko or, you know, a company that might be using uh, parts with uh, much better tolerance. Um, certain radio designs um, that use crystals for various standards, if you're using more than one crystal in the radio for different circuits, but that they need to be on the same frequency, there's always a lot of talk of making sure that those crystals are accurate to each other. So sometimes when you buy um, crystals for standards for certain electronic products, you buy them in pairs or in triplets of matched sets that were already uh, tested to be close enough that you're not going to have any issues with them not being referenced to each other. Interesting stuff. So anyway, we're going to wrap it up pretty soon here, but let me throw it out for any last minute check-ins. This is W2NDG on the OMARC Sunday night science and technology net. Please come now with your call sign, your first name and your location. which brings to mind you know, the, the real-time clock in computers. It was an accessory you could add to a computer that so that it would keep better time when it was off. <laughs> Usually a little plug-in module. Um, yeah. So uh, sometimes, you know, the Internet is going to have to be necessary to make sure your computer keeps accurate time these days. Um, 
we talked about color burst crystals a couple of times, just a little interesting ham radio lore is that there is a color burst group that meets on the color burst crystal frequency, which happens to fall into the uh, CW band on 80 meters. <laughs> so you can uh, build a radio around a uh, color burst crystal. And there's, uh, I forget what they call themselves. Um, but yeah, they, uh, they have a net on that frequency. So um, I'm pretty sure that the, uh, the project I talked about um, in another group once, which is uh, a play on words, Das Derelicht, which uh, refers to that it's, it's a transmitter made out of um, a broken CFL light. A uh, guy who salvaged all the parts out of a non-working CFL base and created the transmitter and used uh, the color burst crystal as the frequency it transmitted on. Um, so they're readily available. You'll find them in junk bins, uh, in uh, surplus stores. Um, so it's a, you know, if you want to design a circuit, um, it's a pretty common frequency to find a crystal on. Um, I think we'll throw it out for any last comments and we're probably going to wrap things up. And as usual, uh, the repeater will be open for anybody who wants to, you know, continue along the subject, but I think we're going to wrap things up at this point. So any last comments on time tonight um, before we close up the net, please come now with your call sign. K2PHM with a trivia question. Uh, go ahead. Why is the color burst frequency a nice even number like 3.575545 megahertz? That's a good question that I don't know the answer to. Anybody out there? All right. I don't know. I don't think anybody else does. Jim, why is it that weird frequency? Well, the horizontal uh, scan frequency is uh, 15.750 uh, kilohertz. And uh, therefore, there are various harmonics up to scale. And 3.5755 uh, falls right in the middle of the uh, harmonics of the 15 so it would minimize interference with the horizontal scan frequencies. Interesting point. And something we don't always think about. Um, frequency is... Um, it's a measurement that occurs in places that we don't really think about um, and can cause a lot of trouble. And it's definitely related to time and might be a subject for a future net. So um, there are engineers that spend a lot of time making sure that what Jim was talking about doesn't happen. Uh, there's a, a lot of places it shows up in our lives, definitely in radio, but I'll give one very simple example and then we'll close things up. It's why if you really look closely at the tread on your tires on your car, the blocks and the grooves and the separations change dimension. As you look at the tire, um, they're different. They get wider and then shorter and then wider as you go through because if they were all the same width, your car would sing and it would almost be un unbearable, the type of noise that it would make and interference patterns it would set up when you went through slight turns on the highway. Yeah and uh, could even, even cause uh, vibration issues uh, as other things resonated at the same frequency. So, uh, hey, it's what I want, originally wanted to go to school for. Uh, you know, find the resonant frequency of this building and then destroy it. <laughs> cool stuff like that. W2NDG on the OMARC Science and Technology Net. And I think we're going to wrap things up. Um, this net occurs every Sunday night at 8 p.m., and we have other nets on this frequency of the uh, Overlook Mountain Amateur Radio Club. 
You do not need to be a member of our club to participate in any of the nets. However, we do encourage membership. Um, we're a friendly group. We love learning. We love hearing. We love being taught. Um, and we love teaching. Uh, we welcome new hams, old hams, and uh, we encourage people to become ham radio operators and move their way up through the licenses. Let me drop. Uh, you can find information about the club at Omark Club. Dot net. I hope I have that right. Omarclub.org. I'm correcting myself, and that's O M A R C C L U B. Omarclub.org. If you'd like to become a member, there are links to uh, our membership form and uh, a donation button so you can pay for a membership. And we encourage people. Um, from all areas that can hear our signal, please join. We'd love to have you. Nets on this repeater are every morning at 8.35 a.m. Uh, Paul, ACTU, AC, AC2UQ, um, along with uh, Rob, W2RWS, and uh, Jed, um, KD2KJU. Um, run the 835 on the 805. It's a very informal check-in net in the morning in a round robin fashion, not a directed net where everybody just kind of gets in and discusses um, how their night was and what they intend to do during the day. Let me draw. Uh, that net and our 6.30 p.m. check-in net um, came, apart, came, came about during uh, the COVID pandemic because people need to communicate. Um, as Paul always says, we're social animals, and this is the original social media. Uh, we get on, we make sure everybody's okay. Uh, we express how we're doing. Uh, sometimes we're not all okay, and it's good to get on the air and talk about it. The 630 net rotates through uh, different club members, um, mostly hosted by Dave, our president. Um, but uh, it, there is a rotation, and Dave is looking, actually, for volunteers to take some of those nets on. And we've had some uh, personnel changes lately, um, people moving around and schedules changing. Every Thursday night at 8 p.m., uh, Dave again hosts the Thursday night OMARC net, which is more of a technical net uh, where a specific subject is sometimes brought up for people to uh, talk about, ham radio topics, other radio topics. But uh, also um, he'll pull the group in a rotation to see if there's something specific that people need help with, people want to know something about, it. people are stumped on a question. Um, great net, 8 o'clock on Thursday nights. Let me drop. Other than the nets, the repeater is always on. Uh, come on, throw your call sign out. Make sure you identify often enough and talk. We're a friendly group of people. We're here for your questions. We love your stories. And uh, please join us. This is W2NDG with K2BHM signing off from the OMARC Sunday Night Science and Technology Net. We'll catch everybody next week. 7-3. Interesting uh, conversation tonight. Really enjoyed it. Thank you all. K2BHM.